Robert Lawson, it's a pleasure to have you here. The uh, co-author, the co, how would you say, editor of the Economic Freedom Index. Yeah, hi Jeff, how are you doing? Good. Hey, what is your status there? You do the, you're the main researcher, right? You're the main, main uh, number cruncher guy? Yeah, I pretty much do all the numbers. Jim Wharton and I, uh, Jim's at Florida State. I was his research assistant 20 years ago. Yeah. And uh, we've been doing this thing since, well, every year since 1996. Well, and that's what's good about it, because you've got a consistent methodology that you employ, you know, across a, a range of time. And so whatever doubts you or others may have about, you know, whether it's possible to quantify economic freedom as such, you know, whatever problem, at least you have a consistent uh, approach, right? So you can, that gives it extra meaning. Yeah, we've got a pretty good time series. We go back to 1970 with some of the data. We didn't start doing this until the, the late 80s and early 90s, but... Because it's all data driven, we just you know we can get tariff rates and tax rates and inflation rates and things like that. We can get that model all the way back in time. So we went ahead and uh, built this data series back to the seventies, and so we've got you know for the United States we can go back to seventy seventy five all the way to two thousand ten. That's our most recent data. Yeah, uh, and uh, do you want to summarize for for listeners in case they haven't uh, they've been asleep for the last uh, week? <laughs> what is the new what's the new thing? Well, uh, you know, every year we come out with these index numbers for economic freedom. We have 144 countries. Uh, I mean, the big news, of course, this year is, uh, as it's been for the last several years, is the continual secular decline of economic freedom in the United States. Um, if you go back to 2000, uh, we were second ranked in the whole world. We were right behind Hong Kong in terms of having the lowest taxes, most free trade, most secure property rights, and all these things we measure. You know, but then uh, very sh surely from 2000 forward, each year the numbers went down, the ratings went down, the rankings fell. It was fifth, and then it was sixth. Uh, last year it was uh, ranked twelfth, uh, and in the most recent edition, eighteenth. I mean, you know, we have countries like Finland and Denmark, you know, social welfare states in Europe that are now more, at least by our measurement, more economically free than the United States. And Canada. Canada is very high. I mean, they're they're ranked, I think, tied for fifth now. So, you know, we, we, we need to stop making fun of the socialists in, in Northern Europe and, and Canada. We are the socialists now. <laughs> There's two, two things going on. One is less freedom, freedom here and uh, more freedom in other places, right? Yeah, there are a lot of places in the world where, where economic freedom is growing. In the last few years, it's been pretty flat globally, but uh, it did go up. The global average went up last year a little bit. Uh, you're seeing good progress, uh, continuing progress in the former Soviet republics that are clawing their way out of you know the the, the old Iron Curtain days. Uh, some of those countries like Estonia are very highly rated. Georgia is very highly rated. Even Kazakhstan is very highly rated. Um, and a lot of African countries are, are progressing. Ghana, Zambia. Uh, we're seeing big improvements in the in the ratings in, in, in a lot of countries around the world. So just because liberalism is dying in, in the United States doesn't mean economic liberalism is dead or all around the world. Do you think that developing countries have, an, have, have certain advantages in a digital age because they don't have a kind of uh, industrial age infrastructure to have to deal with, that they can just kind of invent themselves out of, out of nowhere? Uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely the case. If you look at how quick countries can grow now. Um, it, a lot of it is because it's just so very easy to copy uh, technology and, and bypass the, some of the old things. You know, most countries, I was in the mountains of the, the, the South Caucasus. I was in the literally hundreds of, uh, t tens of miles from the nearest road. And I have perfect cell phone coverage in, hmm. in the mountains of the Caucasus. Yeah. Um, and because they've got cell phone towers at every ridge line all the way through. And mm -hmm. and even even things like lacking lacking a, a gigantic uh, you know publicly owned grid can be an advantage for a comp for a country, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's just, it's easier to bypass again that, that the dead that dead technology. You don't have to go through the stages. You can just leapfrog to the current technology that you know for the most part was was that path was broken by those of us in, in the Western industrial nations. But if you're a poor nation today, you just go straight to the to the modern era. You don't have to progress through you know, dark industrial ages to get to, you know, the kind of clean factories and, you know, living standards we have today. 
Uh, the, the generation you can have. And alter, what about alternative ener energy? There's a lot of talk about that. I, I tend to think it's all overrated solar and you know wind and all this stuff. But uh, these the, a lot of developing countries are, are doing well by these technologies. Is that right? Well, I mean, I, like everywhere in the world, there are subsidies uh, for uh, these kinds of technologies, and you know, you know, one of the biggest problems in the developing world is that Western bureaucrats, and, and very often they're they're driven by a desire to, to to support their crony capitalists back home who are selling this technology. Right. So you know, the OECD, the uh, you know. USAID, they push green technology onto a country. Uh, they make it sound like it's all about the environment, but really it's about trying to get more contracts to their cronies back in Nebraska. Or, okay, or, that's very or, interesting. Or. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing. It's something I guess nobody would have ever expected that it's it actually is an anachronism, isn't it, to divide the world between the industrialized world and the developing world anymore. I mean, it's possible to live a very good life. And uh, countries that are, are uh, uh, just 10 years ago seem, seem sort of backwards, right? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's, obviously, it's a continuum anyway. And countries, uh, you know, slide up and down that continuum. And, you know, I think you'll appreciate this. I don't know what the good life looks like. And every one of us has a different vision of what, what good is and how, my, how life should be. And in America, that's, you know, it's college football on Saturdays. And in Zambia, it's it's different, and so it is a little bit of a, a mistake to talk about you know and think in linear terms of what what development means. Development doesn't mean that they end up looking like you know Dallas, Texas. Um, it means that they develop in the way they they progress and they in the way they want. That requires freedom to do that, though. You can't impose that kind of kind of vision on people. And, and part of the good life is is, is choice. Absolutely. Yeah, without it, without it, you know, again, we're all different about what, what the good life is. Um, you know, a dictator can impose his vision of the good life. You know, uh, like the, the guy in the Bhutan, the Bhutan crazy guy with the, you know, the, the gross national happiness. He has a vision of the good life and doggone it, he's going to make his people live that vision. Well, that's, that's, you know, that's not, that's not, first of all, it's not freedom, but it's also, if you understand that we all have different visions of the good, um, you know, it's only in a context of freedom can you can we all achieve those visions separately. You uh, the concept the idea of, of freedom is itself a gigantic. You guys have done heroic work, uh, no work in kind of slicing and dicing this into how many different components? Well, if, well we use forty two variables now. Okay. Uh, I mean, in some cases, those are based on underlying variables too. So, I mean, the number of, of variables is forty two. We have five areas uh, that, that we group them into. But it's a huge data management project. I mean, yeah. tens, literally tens of thousands of numbers are being managed in, in the process. And you, you actually look at things that uh, somebody might at least initially believe that you would tend to overlook, like monetary policy. That, that's, that's, a, that's a factor, right? Yeah, it is. It's one of our five areas. So we have, just quickly, we have five areas. Size of government, like tax and spend, property rights, that's another area. The third area is money soundness of the monetary uh, regime. And then free trade is the fourth area, and the fifth area is a big one on regulations. And so one-fifth of the index is, is money. And that's the only part of the index the United States is still not going down on. We're, we're pretty much beholden to current and official data. And as you know, notwithstanding the, 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 the risk we all think we have on the monetary front, uh, so far the official data are not showing you know much weakness in the soundness of our money. Yeah. So, so you're you're looking at, at 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 producer prices, consumer prices. That's that's the main thing. You can't you can't measure bubbles and cycles and things like that. Right? Yeah, we're we're, we're doing this for 144 countries too. So you're yeah. really limited to data that you can get for all the countries. We're limited to price indexes, monetary growth numbers, things like that. And um, and property rights. You mean like property, property, right? Property. Yeah. I mean, it's pretty much. We have a whole bunch of areas in the area we call legal structure and property rights. But one of them is a survey question from the World Economic Forum. You know, the World Economic Forum is hardly a you know a libertarian outpost of right. thinking, and, but they do a survey of the whole of executives around the world. And they ask some very simple survey type questions like, "How secure are property rights in your country?" And by it's, which they don't they don't mean they don't mean uh, they don't mean uh, 
uh, whether you can find pirated CDs on the on on the street. What they what they mean is the real right. stuff, right? Whether you yeah, can own I think stuff. Question: There are actually are questions in the survey on IP, and we don't use those questions um, uh, because well, obviously there's the debate we all have about whether IP is legitimate property right. But really, we we're, we're really interested in. Property rights of a real, real property. Property yeah. rights of financial assets, things yeah. like that. Yeah, stuff that people think is property. I'm going to take a guess, not having read in detail the report, that the worst area for the U.S., the worst trend in the United States, is regulation. Actually, it's property rights. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and it's really shocking, Jeff. I mean, uh, I, I don't have this page in front of me. The the numbers, I mean, on, a ten, on our 10-point scale, the number on that question I was just talking about was just a very simple survey question. How secure is property? You know, it was a 9 out of 10 a decade ago. Now it's like a 6.5 out of 10. Now that's a huge, and on the scale we have, that's a massive decline. It's the same survey they give every year, basically the same sample size. People what's, every year. What, 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 just, what, just, what, well, what is it? Is it eminent domain? Is it, is it you know, uh, police I, state confiscations? Or what is it? I think it's a lot of those things, a lot of little things. I think it's Kilo, the eminent domain stuff. I think it's the wars on drug and terrorism, the RICO, you know, you know, just taking people's boats and cars because, you know, someone found an extra thousand dollars in it. I think it's, you know, taking your shoes off at the airports, warrantless wire searches, drones in the air. You know, we have, I saw a drone the other day, Jeff. I mean, they're, 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 you know, our, so our security of our, our persons and papers and places, I think, is under assault. I think it's being reflected in the numbers. So when property rights are weak, when you say they're weak, that doesn't mean that somebody's going to come to my dining room table. It means, it means that somebody can li listen in on, on my, my cell phone call, too. That's a, that's a violation of my property rights. I suspect that's exactly what's in the minds of these people. And you're, we're dealing a lot with business executives on these data, too. So they're, they're the ones having to deal with you know, repeated uh, questions and assaults on, on their business enterprises, not not just taxes, but, you know, privacy type type concerns and things of that sort. I find it amazing that regulation is not number one because, I mean, maybe it's just my own, my news bias will have a bias, but I have a sense that we're becoming, you know, as more regulated than the Soviets. Well, to, well I, I don't know if it's that bad, but it's certainly that number, those numbers are trending downward as well. Yeah. Um, one of the... Uh, we, we don't really measure corruption too much in the index, but, you know, corruption is a, is sort of the, is the, uh, is the result of, of regulation. Yeah. We do have a question in there on, on what, what the World Economic Forum politely calls extra payments. I think you and I would call those things bribes. And, and those numbers are also shockingly changing in a negative direction. Um, you know, I've never had to give a bribe in the United States yet, but apparently some people are, are saying, you know, extra payments are now happening in, in this country, in favoritism. So uh, the, the regulations, we the numbers for regulation are, are getting worse. We have a measure of uh, bureaucracy costs, cost of bureaucracy, of dealing with red tape. Yeah, yeah. That measure is down for the United States as well. Well, the other thing is that regulations might also be reflected in your property rights uh, issue. I mean, if you've got you've got a hotel and you want to refurbish it, you know, and you're facing uh, endless endless red tape on what paint you can use, uh, what, what you know, what pesticides you can use to get rid of bed bugs, what how you can construct your staircase because of disability regulations, whatever. That that would be uh, seen as an attack on property rights, basically. Yeah, I think it's yeah, it's all it really is all one ball of. Of wax, we're, you know, we obviously put these things into compartments and categories, but there is bleed over uh, from area to area a lot. That's why I think you know we're seeing a trend. I mean, of the forty-two variables for the United States, you know, it's a solid twelve or fifteen of them are in a major decline. The rest are pretty flat, but the, that drives the average down. You know, well, not to over bias it to the U.S. So the. Uh you think you think Finland, you think Denmark. There's some other cool places, uh, not not Europe, uh, not the old the old world of the old Europe, but uh, but some of the reformed economies, uh, well, post Soviet. Well, the post Soviet Estonia stands out there. Yeah. I think ranked twelfth or thirteenth. In this hemisphere, Chile, Chile is uh, they're ranked I think seventh or eighth on the index, uh, top ten. Um, massive reforms. We all, I mean, many of us know a lot about the Chilean reforms. Yeah. Uh, and we pick those up quite nicely. There's, again, I, I mentioned Africa, uh, Zambia, and Ghana. I mean, they're still pretty low ratings, but compared to the the two or three ratings they had, you know, ten or fifteen years ago, now they're getting ratings of five, six, seven. They're above the average in the global index. 
that's really encouraging for a lot of people in Africa to see some reforms. There. Any other surprises in, in, in Central or South America? Well, no, no, it's all pretty much, I mean, most of our, our sort of dioceses are understood. Chile is highly ranked. Argentina is very, very low. Yeah. Venezuela is dead last. Venezuela is 144 out of 144. Yeah. Uh, Zimbabwe is now up to 143, so <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, if, if they're no longer holding the last spot. Uh, Brazil, uh, I have a lot of friends there. What's the story? Bad. Yeah, Brazil's very low, low yeah. rated. I mean, you know, I know it's a growth story there, uh, and I know there's a lot of innovation and, and things happening there, but from a standpoint of economic freedom, it is, a, it is it's certainly not Soviet-style central planning, but it, the government's hand is is deep and widespread throughout the Brazilian economy. Um, it, you know, Adam Smith said something once about how, uh, uh, you know, people will, pro I'm quite paraphrasing, people will progress in spite of uh, what the government does. And you know, Brazil's a great example. They, those people down there are just natural innovators. If, if you give them a little bit more freedom, they could be incredibly prosperous. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess you could say that about many places in the world, right? Sure. That's for sure. Uh, which is one of the one of the inspiring and, and depressing things about your, your work, I suppose. Can you say something about China? It's hard. Uh, you know, China gets a low rate. They're ranked 110th. It's well below average. Uh, it's in the sort of third quartile of our, our data set. You know, if we only give one number for one country. So overall, it's a very low number. Obviously, if you were giving a number specifically for Shenzhen or, or Shanghai, it would be you know, it'd probably be as high as Hong Kong's rating, maybe, you know, a 9 out of 10. Uh, but, you know, we also have Outer Mongolia. you got, you know, interior provinces that are still incredibly tightly controlled by the state. Yeah. One of the big problems in all of China, though, is the capital markets are completely state-run. Internally, uh, now, foreign, foreign investors have access to the global capital market, but domestic uh, Chinese citizens who want to access capital markets, borrow money, their only choice is state state banking, and, and the entire investment structure of the country is being run by state bureaucrats, mm -hmm. and that I think is going to massively limit the upside on China until they get a more competitive capital market functioning. You said something at lunch uh, years ago to me um, that has haunted me ever since, and I keep wondering if you're right. Uh, I mean, I, I've thought about it often, but you said that in today's world, given our knowledge, given the level of division of labor, globalization, the, the amount of exchange, that it's really, really hard to ruin a country. It's really hard to destroy prosperity. Remember that you said that to me? I think I did say that. You yeah, know, and I was, I've, wondered, I've wondered ever since whether, whether that's right. And I'm not sure, but it seems like the U.S. is taking every step to, to, to do the wrong things rather than the right things. Yeah, I, I, those were more optimistic days back then, I, I think, Jeff. Um, I'm, I'm sharing your concern. Huh. You know, it, it's, I think it's getting harder to ruin people's lives, though, because people can move. And one of the greatest forces in, 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 in favor of freedom is our ability to take flight, both our, our persons but also our capital. Hmm. You know, you look at the assault in, in France now, uh, you know, just on taxation, you know, driving top rates to, to 75% and, uh, and the capital outflight of, of, of France is already starting and it's slapping those guys right across the face and improperly so. So um, they might be able to ruin a piece of real estate, yeah. but the people can leave that piece of real estate, we'll find a happier real piece of real estate somewhere else. But I think... You know, we we all we might need to be uh, studying up our, our foreign languages, Jeff. Uh, you, maybe the young. You, know. you t you teach. You have a lot of young students. Uh, what is your sense from talking to them? Well, you know, right now I'm teaching old students. I'm teaching MBAs, and okay. they're not exactly a good group to to call representative. Uh, you know, uh, I think there's been a change in the students I've talked to though in the last few years. Certainly, it's not just the recession. It's like it's. It's a sense that, you know, hey, where's the best jobs going to be? Well, the best jobs are going to be in Homeland Security. Wow. Okay. You know, uh, that's just not healthy yeah. uh, when people are aspiring to be government bureaucrats. That's what happens in third world countries where the best jobs are working for the army or working for the post office or whatever. People aspire for those jobs. It should be the best jobs people aspire to work for, you know, Silicon Valley or something. Well, and at least if a kid if a kid's uh, in college or about to graduate college and can and doesn't have a lot of liabilities, doesn't have a lot of uh, ex expenditure, uh, 
that a lot of revenue needs, it's it's a good time to go abroad and, and shop around, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. I mean, good advice. Study abroad and uh, start thinking about where you might want to put your roots down, too. I mean, you know, it's a big world. We have airplanes. It's, it's, it's increasingly easy to to escape a, an oppressive regime. And that it's also part of American history, right? We've, it we've, is. Mo we've moved. We've moved a lot sure. of times. Uh, I know you're exhausted, and thank you for your amazing work, and thanks for sitting down with me today. Hey, thanks, Jim. Okay, good to talk to you, Robert.